Before I say anything uh, more, I'd like to invite all the speakers of today on stage um, so that we can open out today's session for a discussion. I'd also like to request Kumari Malavika Sarukai to also kindly come on stage uh, so that she can lead the question and answer session with the dancers. So we open out the floor for questions now. Uh, well, while we were designing the conference, there was good reason why we kept the question answer session at the end collectively for the session because I'm sure as you have seen, many of the thoughts that, they have, that have emerged from the four young speakers today are so intertwined and interconnected and they're not really isolated ideas that we are talking about. Um, there is a mic among the audience uh, uh, which is available with Tulsi up here. Um, it's really been a wonderful morning. Um, and it's, I think it, it was, uh, uh, Ms. Malavika Sarika will agree that it's wonderful to hear all of them speak. And congratulations, really proud. Thank you. Um, this is actually in response to one of the comments that you made about mediocrity. Um, how many of, I mean, how do we recognize mediocrity, whether it's in ourselves or around us? Because this self-awareness that we're talking about, it's a very important uh, point. How many of us will recognize that we are mediocre dancers? I mean, this, who is to define mediocrity? I think that's a very interesting like, question and to say how do we um, recognize mediocrity, but I think I, my entry point would be quite different. I'd say when we hit excellence, we know it. When we as dancers, when we hit excellence, in, if I had to elaborate it, when we hit, when we are in the dancing um, mode and we come across flow, a sense of flow within the, the dancing body. And if we're able to create more and more moments of flow, then we know we are on another, we are entering another zone. When we get into, like, when we get into um, dancing where we are not thinking dance, but we are dance, I can only speak of mediocrity when I think of excellence and say, how do we know that? Because I agree that, you know, people love to dance, right? We all love to dance. So we're all going to dance. But the fact is, there are only a few in every generation who will make such a indelible mark and who will be contributors to the world of dance, who will be remembered long after. So there are many others who will also dance and who must dance and who like to dance. But when we say mediocrity, I mean, a very simple thing would be, no anger, shoot them and all that, then it's mediocre. Kai is not in positions, or there's no aramandi. I mean, these are all the initial stages of like mediocrity where people should know, but don't know. Because we love to dance. Everyone wants to dance. I've had people come and, you know, uh, when students want to learn, you know, with me, they bring this little seven-year-old and say, whenever we put part to porta, they immediately dance. When will she become a dancer? And I'm saying, you know, this is very alarming. Because any child will dance. I mean, we love to move. We want to dance. But dance in the bigger arena, dance as professionals, dance dancers who become artists, it's a long path, 
But how do we know we are mediocre by knowing what excellence is? If we hit, as I said, in my experience, 40 years and more of dancing, when I'm coming to a stage when I know the body is humming, it's dancing, and I'm not thinking dance, but I am in the moment of dance, then I know I've come someplace. So I think it's also a lot of self-questioning. And we need people, for when you say mediocrity, we need people around us who we trust, who will tell us when we're mediocre. And say, you know what, you might not have to become a dancer. Perhaps you could write on dance. Perhaps you could become a rasika. Perhaps you could blog on dance. Who knows? Something else. But not everyone can become a dancer. Dancing is difficult. Contributing to the world of dance is difficult. Sustaining that, that you know, that thirst to, to train is difficult. That's why most people give up halfway, they do six, seven years and they've given up. Training is very hard. So I think my response would be, how can we touch excellence? And I am sure that when you touch excellence, you'll know it. You will know it. can elaborate on that, how you said in your opening speech that we should uh, uh, actively discriminate between excellence and mediocre dancers. I want to know from the young dancers how they propose to do that because every dancer of today projects themselves as excellent in dance uh, and all dancers will be remembered, especially the mediocre ones, because social media <laughs> will make sure it's an archive that you are remembered forever and ever, and uh, if I can add to that, uh, spirituality has no definition for all the young dancers. It, uh, since it has no absolute definition, then what is spirituality in dance? In, in, is it not just to mold yourself to the form of uh, God, as most Bharatanatyam dancers uh, seem to uh, say, that uh, that is what they try to reach. I hope I'm saying it uh, clearly. To mold oneself to the original form, which is God, through living a spiritual life. start. <clears throat> I think a large part of that is training. Um, I think we need guides, we need teachers, and we need teachers to push us further. I don't think it's something we can do ourselves. Like she said, we need that trust, we need that um, the push to go deeper, to deeper, to train further. Um, that's, that would be my answer, to move further towards excellence and away from mediocrity. I too agree with the point of training. And, and in the process of training, to spend time with the movements that you do, to understand from where it emerges and what it resonates to you. And that's why training becomes important, spending time with dance. And I feel when you do that more is when you discover a lot of facets about yourself. And I think that's what is also a spiritual path where you rediscover yourself and to be able to be present in that very moment, in the present moment. So I feel that it goes hand in hand. That's continuous training uh, and the spiritual path, seeking spirituality. Not sure if I was clear. I 
I mean, well, I can, from what I said, it's about a mindfulness. It's about, yeah, it, it is absolutely about an experience. It cannot be articulated, but we're asked to articulate it. But it is experiential, and it's about, um, it's about mindfulness, and that brings about transformation of the mind. And ultimately, that is what creates expansion of consciousness. Just to add to this, because, you know, we've been talking about the spiritual, and I know these words are so, you know, easily used, and sometimes they just stick on us, you know, and sometimes you say, you know, like, let, let these words, and then the jargon, and the baggage, and everything else all comes on, tumbling on top of us. But I think if you look at it as dance, in the experience of dance, right, so when we're looking at dance, which is just not performative, right, we're saying, can we live the dance? Is it possible? And then we're trying very hard to do this sort of meditative approach to sort of try to live it. I would say spirituality, I mean, a, a sort of distinct moment of spirituality is if when you are dancing, you don't feel the I. If, even if it's released momentarily, that for me is spiritual. It might come about because I'm dancing about the divine. It could be that I'm already, my focus, my energy is going towards it. Or it needn't be only um, restricted to uh, content about the divine. I might be doing something on trees, which I love, and I might be deeply spiritual because I'm finding a moment which is beyond the I. That is spiritual. So I think what Maitri was saying, and, and to go back to this thing of training, I think in training, there are some times when she brings a work to, to class and we're working on it. And when I look at it, it seems wonderful in itself. But when I start penetrating it and looking deeper within it, then there are so many levels and layers of, of exploration and discovery. And then we're deepening the understanding. She is deepening her understanding of that. And that is about the technique, which is, I think, is critical because all of them have wonderful technique. But the question is, can we go further? That is always the question. Can I go further with my technique? I don't know it all. So that is the quest. That is the search to say we are great, wonderful dancers, but can we please look within the content and see where it takes us? I, I just had something to add. Um, I mean, sorry, I'm taking a little um, idea. Of, it's just um, th when you say, when you ask us what spirituality is, I think the, whether spirituality was always a part of art or not is still being debated. I mean, because we're constantly discussing the purpose of dance and the purpose why people danced then and then how it evolved and what it is today. But I think each of us can find our own definition during performance. And I believe that, I think at that moment, even like Auntie said, briefly, when we go beyond ourselves, or say there's a collective gasp in the audience, or there's a collective moment of high where everyone who is involved, who is actively, even when the audience is actively involved in the performance and they reach that one second that cannot be replicated, I think that could also be a part of the spiritual process of dance where we're trying to reach for something that is so beyond the tangible and can be enjoyed for a brief moment and gives you some kind of peace inside. I mean, I don't know what an accepted definition of spirituality if there is even one, I'm unsure. As a youngster, I find my spiritual happiness in that one second. And yes, the training and process is very important. And having that kind of understanding of the body is one kind of spirituality. But that, that highest point that comes to you briefly and never in all performances, but one in a million, that one moment, I think is what um, gives me a sense of spirituality. You know, if you make it less, less sort of um, high up, like you try to bring it down to the practical part of spirituality or what is it, I think it's alignment. 
right? So when the body and mind, after those years of struggle, which continues, and at some point when we're able to align it, when we come to moments of alignment, when we are in Shruti, I think it's, it takes us to another level of experience of dance. So when a musician, as I said in my talk as well, when they sing in, two, with, in Shruti, when they are completely aligned, what do they do? They close their eyes because they're so much in bliss. And we as listeners also, we also close our eyes because we're also in bliss. What does a dancer do? They have to dance. They have to open their eyes and still and still look to find alignment, which is very, very difficult. But there are moments when you come to those moments of body, mind in sync. That is also a stage of spirituality, alignment, harmony. And then, of course, it has different levels of experience. Uh, yesterday, you were explaining about uh, the Shruti in dance. I would like you to explain that to the audience, simply, about the space and time concept. I don't think I should talk so much because we need them to speak. We need all the young dancers to speak. No, I was just uh, in a casual conversation, we, uh, we were talking and saying that, you know, for dancers, other than your inner alignment, right, which we just said, body-mind is anyway an, an alignment we need to do. But other, other than that, what we need to do in, when we're dancing is that we have space and time, two fundamentals, right? space and time and this is like critical to how we dance and uh, how we are able to explore it so then these two become two very central very um yeah fundamental like pillars to which we have to be extremely alert so you when you come i i've said sometimes um, um, to dancers training with me that you're not dancing in space you are dancing with space you understand? You're dancing with space. It's not that you come in and we are doing something and we leave. If you truly dance, when you come onto this stage, before the space is like, it's like level. When you leave this, it should be alive. The space should be alive. So I'm saying, is dance only something we come and we dance anywhere? Or does space matter? Does time matter? How you move your arm from here to here in a takita matters. It's not enough to say, oh, takita, three beats from here to there, I go and come. No. What is the spatial movement? What are you doing with the rhythm on your feet? Do your feet speak? Do we want footwork? Do we want the footwork to match the arm movements? And sometimes, as I said, you know, I don't know. I just seem to notice that sometimes with the younger dancers, and you must really tell me the, the answer because I don't know this, is that I find, you know, sometimes the torso and upward, the arm movements are very precise and they're coming very well, you know, and it's looking like, like everything is being etched well. But when I look at the feet, I find I'm not getting that footwork to match the arm movement, the torso movement. I don't know why that happens, but I do believe if you're able to match it, we do better. It would be more. It would be more articulate the dance. So, going back to answer this question, as I said, I feel that there is space and time which are critical to the dancer, and that has to be which we perhaps don't think about. So the only way I could push a dancer to think is saying, "Don't dance in space. Dance with space." So then it comes to mindfulness, right? It comes to that alertness with which you're able to dance when every movement you make matters. So it's just a lot to think about. So don't feel burdened. He asked me this question, I'm just answering it. Check. 
Okay, so uh, we have all understood spirituality over the years in terms of what, how you have defined it right now uh, as this hallowed, uh, unattain unattainable uh, kind of uh, uh, state uh, when you actually define things like uh, uh, excellence in dance is about uh, being in the flow, becoming dance, and all these vague, nebulous, undefinable, intangible uh, expressions which are extremely and highly subjective to each individual. Uh, like for instance, the last thing you said, is that the only way to dance? Is, is some other dancer, does he have the freedom to think about the exact opposite of what you said and still you know, become excellent in what, what he wants to achieve? Now, the title of the uh, session as given by the convener, says redefining spirituality. So what we heard from you so far is just what we already know about what spirituality is. So were you just trying to repeat the definition or reiterate it, re-emphasize what we already know? Or were you trying to redefine spirituality going forward? Uh, because every time you say things like, uh, you need to be in a state where you would know excellence if you attained it. And when Shweta says, Once, one in a million performances, that one moment I get. So which means, is she a mediocre dancer the rest of the time? I mean, how, how is this vague, nebulous uh, you know, definition helping any of the any dancers you know, figure out what to do? I'm saying, it's, if it's highly subjective, then it's left to each, each person, right? Then he would say that I'm in the flow. I'm in the state of excellence. So how do you, how do you reconcile? I think that is what the convener wanted to figure out. Should we redefine? Yeah, should we have a word from you? Yeah. If I may just, um, uh, I just like to, because you brought up the thing of redefining, I don't think when we say redefining, we mean finding a new definition for. No, it, uh, you cannot find a new or a newfangled definition for something. The idea that we had in mind is can we, from our own experience, understand and explain what that sense of finding something larger is, right? So that's what we were um, attempting to do. Um, and I think for all of us, it's also a pursuit and a journey. So when we say something like it's that one moment that we experience, the aspiration is for your 90 minutes of performance to become that. That is, that is where we're, I'm guessing, collectively heading towards. It's just something that I wanted to mention. Uh. Yeah, I, um, she's, she's, put, uh, she's, put it, she's put what I wanted to say. Um, just because, uh, is it sincere? Okay. Um, the, what I, you, you spoke about mediocrity, whether if you don't hit a high, does it mean you're a mediocre artist otherwise? No, I think we're all striving towards it, isn't it? So unless, if, if every moment we are going to hit a high, we're all, go all going to be walking around like, uh, right? So, no, if you've understood that, then it's, that it means that you are going, you're, you're trying to go to, it's a journey. Therefore, your, um, uh, you know, you may not experience that moment's high every time. Um, no, pursuing to hit a high, isn't it? Isn't that what Malaji said? She's, excellence is when you when there are moments when you hit a high, is that what, or I don't know. Is it no? You know, if you're talking about excellence, like think about it in music, how do they know they're excellent? No, oh my God. No. Then they be, might be completely, no, no, no. It's no, not, no. no how does an artist in music, when the musician, I don't know if you have any musicians here, but uh, please answer if you are here. How do musicians know that they are in, in form? You know, in that moment, that thing, zone of excellence, that something is happening. How do they know? Yeah, I'm asking you. 
when you asked a question, we're trying to like even uh, Priya Darshini was also trying to explain to you that his answer is applause. No, applause is actually quite wrong because you're just looking at it from the from the viewer's point of view. Here we're in the practice of it, right? We are the, the performing part of you. The performers who have to actually create that, so they have to sort of bring it out of themselves and they have to dance it or sing it. So there is a sense when the musician, when they are in complete like alignment with Shruti, you know, then there is a certain flow which happens. And so also for the dancer, unfortunately, we don't have this physical reference of anything to say, oh, I am in line with this, therefore I'm this. It is a, it's a much more difficult, much more difficult practice because they have to say, uh, am I in line with alignment within me, which no, none of you can see, but they have to feel and they have to, you know, really work on that. So excellence is different. It's, it's at many levels, there is the beginning, we start with Anga Shuddham and all that, which we talk of perfection. And then it moves up. And then as Maithili mentioned in her talk as well, that there are many, you know, the mindfulness which comes into play really takes you deeper into, into the sight of the body and the mind to say what else can, it, can happen. So it, it is a personal and an internal process but most distinctly, it can be felt by the audience. Okay, and I also want to mention, you know, art is, there are moments, it is intangible. You can only feel it, you can experience it, you may not be able to articulate it. So, uh, the word nebulous, um, there are moments when you, can, uh, when, when you can reach it, there are moments it is out of your reach. It is like that. I think all of us will agree it is like that. That is the nature of art. That's the quality of art. And uh, I also feel that there are different definitions that I heard today. Each uh, speaker today had uh, their own view. I mean, they had done, um, they spoke about spirituality from their own experiences, which was very interesting for me. And it gave me new, uh, it gave me perspective of, uh, of spiritual, uh, spirituality from their point of view, which is very interesting. And that to me is redefining, isn't it? Thank you. How does one develop the capacity to be in touch with reality constantly or uh, calling uh, spirituality as oneness with the universal, I mean, all the spirits? Oneness with that and how does it manifest in reality consistently, ongoingly and in connection with that? Uh, is it possible to enforce responsibility on the audience? Or, put it in the other words, in uh, how do we get them responsible ongoingly? So that, that momentary oneness as we are performing with the audience is, is there consistently. How do we do that? Uh, I think that's what all of us are trying to find out, what to become <laughs> oneness with something unknown to us yet. I think you, the definition, if you want to give a definition, you pick it up along the way. That's all you can do. Then, um, then about uh, mediocrity and excellence, I, I agree with uh, Akka, because you will know. Because as dancers or musicians, um, in all our kacheris or programs, we know today was in my best day. Or someday, I feel good. Today was the best. That is what is more important to an artist than, um, I don't want to say this, but than what the audience think. It, it differs, actually. It's a process. 
I'm not putting the audience down, but the audience might have come that day with a preoccupied mind. Only the that side and this side becomes one, then only the rasa is born, right? Exactly. That's what I want to connect with. What are we delivering there? They are coming, however it is, whatever it is. They are physically being present here. It is with commitment. I want to see it from there. They're not just coming to time pass. No, it is their time. They're coming there with commitment. From there, how can we deliver as, dance, as dancers, how can we deliver them what they ought to get delivered at that moment in time? And with so much of practice that we have, we are committed. We are equally committed. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you have uh, raised a very good point because they are coming, what it is called, their leisure. Leisure, I mean, they, when they have time, that's what you say. I dare not call it their leisure. leisure. I or value their time. Okay, no, 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 they have time and they want to go to a kacheri. That's what it means. Whether if it's leisure, it doesn't matter. But uh, Srimati Rukmini Devi says a very interesting uh, thought on audience. I mean, dance is not something you watch uh, when you have time, leisure time. It is good if you have uh, leisure time and you go for a performance to watch. Because when you are in leisure, that's the most wonderful time when you become yourself. You're not think about, thinking about anything. So if you come with that state of mind, then that is perfect. That is what we are all looking forward. You are saying that they are uh, deliberately coming, making time for themselves, right? Yes. That's nice. Thank you. You know, I, I think, so. just to add a quick point to that, I think both the artist and the audience have to, you know, have to be active. The dancer has done all her rehearsals, she's come on stage, or he has come on stage. They have to dance with a certain conviction and intensity, right? So they have come and they're trying to do their best that day, dancing, intensity, conviction. What the viewer has to do is, they have struggled with traffic and everything else and finally turned up at the dance program. Now we have made our dance concerts only one and a half hours, so it's much shorter. So, so they don't have to sit for too long. So it's one in one and a half hours. What the viewers have to do is that they have, if the dancer, if the dancer is intense and powerful in the sense of, of communicating, the viewer has to not look at the performance. They have to look into the performance. So they need that empathy to look into the performance. And I think you said this beautiful thing about behold. So it's not when you, s you have to do more than just look. That is also the duty of uh, the viewer. Other than finding time and being there physically present, it's emotionally what will you do? If the performer is really good and performing wonderfully, what does the viewer do? So there's duty there too, something they have to do. I think also, um, there's also the question of the journey of the artist and, um, and that affects decisions, that affects choreography, that affects the development of the artist over time. And a lot of times now audiences come in with an expectation. They expect a certain level of, you know, performative quality or confidence or, you know, they come in with expectations and I think that places a pressure, I mean, yeah, a certain pressure on the performer to, um, or, I mean, the contrary is probably true, that to stay with one's conviction and with one's beliefs and with one's journey at that present moment requires increased courage because you're saying, you know what, this is where I am, this is what I want to dance about, this is what I believe in, so you come with me. And it's okay if you don't like what I do, but this is what I want to dance about. So I feel the more we have that honesty and that sincerity and that courage, the audience will at some point come with us and the onus will be on them 
to like Malaka and Rakesh said, to behold and not come and sit and expect us to deliver to them. Like exactly what she said, do we have the mindset of accepting the way it is delivered? That, that question we have to ask ourselves. And also, many times we go to a performance with a very conditioned mind. If whatever is not tallying with uh, what you believe in and it's not the same what the artist's interpretation is, then you become judgmental. We are all judgmental, no doubt about it. So is it possible to just remove our uh, years of accumulated condition, conditioning of our minds, then just look at the art and artist and see and appreciate her or his way of interpretation? Have you ever taken in lesson, oh, this is also a possible way of interpreting it? We very rarely do that. That's, that's a question we all should ask ourselves. I'd like to thank you all for a really uh, enlightening morning for us. My question is that as the generations move forward and we are walking very, we are walking away from the settings and the time frame in which all our uh, traditional texts were written. And in this era where social media is distracting young students and young dancers, how are young dancers expected to relate to, uh, say, traditional tales of uh, Krishna and Yashoda when they spend all their time on, you know, WhatsApp and Instagram? <laughs> That's what she spoke. I think um, dance, the way it is taught, Bharatanatyam, follows a certain format. When you go to your first class, you learn just the namaskaram or you just learn the stance, aramandi, murumandi, so on. It's the art form has a process in which it engages a student. It doesn't, the first day you go, you're not expected to know your mythology and know all the characters, who does what, and begin, um, you're not jumping into, a, in, jumping into waters that you're already aware of. I had a very different upbringing to that of um, many who belong to homes that come with music and dance in them. My engagement with dance started with the rhythm aspect of it. Each one of us engages with dance differently as young youngsters. It is the capacity of the form and definitely the teachers and the environment that you learn it in that increases your curiosity and develops your mind to understand, like you said, Krishna and Radha, to be very blunt, better. On the first day itself, you're not handed in a story or you're not given a character and said, please understand what Krishna is or no. It's, it starts with the physical and the mental engagement begins at a little later stage to slowly then evolve and then that becomes the crux of your uh, performance or understanding and engagement with art. So it's not compulsory that every student who performs or learns the art form has to be well versed and well aware with um, our mythology or our traditional texts. But it becomes later on their choice as to how much they choose to engage with them. And that therefore develops their own uh, performance, their own characteristics and how they choose to present dance. Each of us engage with traditional texts on different levels. It, there's no standard. Um, each of us learn the Natya Shastra or each of us learn the Abhinaya Tarpana. Some of us have, some of us have learned and then it's there in the back of mind. Some of, some of us know it by heart even now. But that doesn't determine the final uh, performance. I mean, this is just what I believe from what how I have engaged with texts. Uh, that is also about uh, your priorities, right, in life. You, you can either choose to practice what your teacher has taught you coming back home 
or you can spend time on WhatsApp or Instagram. That's a choice what we all make. And it is about the priorities in our life that we have to be very clear upon. And it is a practice, and if it is inculcated from a young age, it is possible. And only an inquisitive mind finds out answers. The answers doesn't come to you that easily. You have to break your head, sweat a lot. You have to ask, then only it will come to you. So I hope you will choose not to use Instagram and WhatsApp anymore. There are no two ways to teaching or learning. But like they all said, I mean, it's, it's your choice, end of the day. You decide what you want to do with the dance, whether you want to do it professionally or whether you want to do it for your passion or for your hobby. But the way it is learned, the way it is taught is just one. And I think the more you engage with it and the more you spend time with it is when it would start revealing a lot of things and you would start discovering. And for that, you need to time, uh, spend time and spend less time on Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook, yeah. Sorry, can I just add something? I think the other thing that's really beautiful about dance is uh, the poetry and the poet poeticness of it. So it's about, it, it's about human emotions that we feel, you know? Like in dance, we might not use our phone to send a text, we might write a letter, but like the feeling that you get when you write that special letter is the same feeling you get when you send that special text. But um, there's a different, the vocabulary is poetic. We engage with nature. Um, we engage with, you know, things that are in a sense timeless. And in, but in that, the root of it is an emotion that we all feel. So even though now it is, you know, a fast paced moving world where we are on social media all the time and, you know, we communicate through technology, like the feelings and the emotions that we feel are the same. And, um, and the way it's expressed is I feel even more beautiful than kind of the mundane way we go about it. So that's where dance becomes sort of something invaluable to us now as people. Uh, I just wanted to ask the young, all the young artists today, um, on social media you see a lot of posts, you see a lot of videos posted, comments, and uh, we are taken into the very private spaces of the dance, the students, the dancers, etc., which normally otherwise we wouldn't. So you see somebody in a, you know in a short top and a tights, um, you know, doing a very uh, an alaripu or a jatiswaram or a tilana, and then you hear comments like "You rock, you're the best." Now, this also defines the way we see dance, isn't it? Because when I see that, I'm also seeing the different kinds of, like you were talking about, I'm seeing so many different um, ways of presenting dance. Now, I'm confused. Um, should I accept it as, okay, this is that person's way of, or should I feel, you know, uh, I am sometimes appalled and very alarmed when I see the kind of costumes or the lack of costume or the proper attire uh, when, you know, you post a video on Facebook. Um, I just want to know your thoughts, thoughts of uh, all of you here about this. Okay, if I can be very honest. <laughs> I think maybe it's a generational thing. When I practice by myself in my practice space, I don't wear a half sari. I wear a tank top and tights. Um, so, and, and for me, that helps me, you know, uh, pay attention to every part of my body and my alignment. Uh, that doesn't make it any less of a practice or any more authentic. Um, but at the same time, I don't post those videos online. So, I, 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 I don't, um, I don't feel that confusion when I see it necessarily because that's normal to me to practice Avarnam in my tank top and tights. But at the same time, I wouldn't post that. I mean, that's... When we post it on social media, we 
media, you're actually performing. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yes. You're not performing in your private space. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of where I stand on the issue. Namaskaram. Uh, as a Bhagnatyam dancer, I fear that the mindset of people, the spectators, have changed so much. They, they expect something different, like they expect a contemporary dance from a traditional dancer nowadays. Like, they, like, like you see on um, Indian Draga, they, they started hosting some dancers, contemporary dances. And people see that and they expect us to do the same thing. Like, they don't uh, know that the traditional one is better than the uh, contemporary one. That, that's what I feel, that's what I feel. But being a dancer in the middle of the world now, uh, the future lies before me, and the great past of Bharatanatyam, which I saw, like my uh, gurus saw and taught us, as a dancer, in this world now, should I have to move with the world and dance and change my style of dancing into a contemporary one and market myself, or should I have to stay with the traditional one and dance it? If at all I don't change, if at all I don't change and dance the traditional one, that which accept no change will fade in air, or if at all I change and move into a contemporary Bharatanatyam dancer, is it not something I do bad for my traditional dance form? So what should I do as a dancer in present day world? Haven't our mind changed? It's not only about the spectators. Even we are also living in the same century. So it's a question that you can ask yourself also. And it will be better, I mean, I don't know, uh, it is something you find out throughout your journey. Uh, a better person would be some, somebody senior like uh, Malaka or Priyaka because what they find relevant for today. So that is something you pick up along with your journey. Yeah, I think initially you should stick on to what you believe in. Then eventually you will change. And I think da learning dance uh, leads to transformation. And it's important to uh, re-question what your purpose is with dance at every step, at every stage. And I think that would help in not getting caught in the mad rat race and to understand where you want to take your dance to. I think also not feeling the pressure of what you think other people want you to do. It's what you believe in. And, um, and it's important to do that because that shows too. If you, you know, believe in your traditional dance and you do it with that conviction, it'll show. Whereas if you do contemporary because you feel like you should, you know, that will show. And there are so many artists who have, say, for example, Aditi Mangaldas, who does traditional Kathak, but also has found the urge or the vocabulary in a more contemporary style to do that as well. Um, I think be honest, you know, with yourself. Well, uh, I just want to add this, that to that question. Um, my personal view on it would be that, um, you know, um, when we talk about costumes, um, sarees, I believe, were a part of the costume on stage because they were worn daily during that era. It was a costume of everyday life. And today, the costume of everyday life is tank tops and jeans. So where is this um, line that we draw between being what we are today in everyday life 
and what we want to be on stage. Now it's become two different things where we have to make a choice every day to either live a life um, that we would um, want to be on stage or adapt to, pers uh, adapt to, to uh, today's life, today's world, where everything is accepted and everything is westernized and Indianized and Indo-Western, everything is intertwined into itself. Um, when it comes to costumes, this, uh, this, this is what I feel that um, since we wear, we, d we are not reluctant about uh, wearing anything that we like. Um, so does dancing make us stick to what was old? And this, does, will this make us look like we are sticking to the old? Mm, sorry, just as a counter question to that, um, we all still uh, go for our weddings in saris. We get married in Ghagra Cholis. We don't get married wearing tank tops and jeans. So I don't think that dichotomy, personally, I feel is not something between dance and society, but it's perhaps something that we've just you know, adapted in, in life in general. So why is there a dichotomy about going on stage uh, in a sari or in traditional costume? Uh, in that sense, would we become two different personalities? I mean, yes and no. When you're on, st when you, I mean, when I'm dancing, I do feel like a different person than I do like when I'm not dancing. So th I mean, and I think that is the purpose. As dancers, we inhi we inhabit another mindset, another space. Even the process of wearing the makeup, putting on the costume. We're sort of transforming into this, like I said, use the word patram, and like that's a very ideal word, but it's true. We're in a sense transforming ourselves. So I don't think that we need to feel a dichotomy or a rift between the people that we are off stage and the people that we are on stage. It, it is about transformation. So. I, I just, uh, just like to add to this is that when you go to a gym, you don't go in a ghagra choli. We go in whatever attire is suited for the gym because that's what. Even if I go to a gym, am I wearing the sari? No, I'll wear something. I might not wear a tank top, <laughs> but whatever. And when I go to the gym, because I have to exercise. Similarly, if I'm going to on the stage to perform, then there's a certain uh, convention and certain you know code which I will follow. So I will wear uh, the, the dance costume that way. Now, why have all of them come like this today? Now, they, this is not their everyday attire, I don't think so. Uh, but because there is a certain formality here, uh, and uh, we have all come uh, dressed for context. Context matters. Nowadays, we are dropping the sense of context when the line between formal and informal is blurring. It's just blurring. So people are just doing whatever they want here and there. But no, I think uh, when we talked of sensitivity, it's also sensitivity not only to the poetry which we're doing, where there's context. It's sensitivity to life. It is sensitivity to context, how we are. If you were going to visit your great-grandmother, you might wear a salwar kameez, not shorts. It's context. Because this happened to me when I was taking a spikmike something in one of these places, and this uh, kid came in there for class, and in like tights and something, I said, why will you come to the gym? Like, go home, you know, like go change and come. This is a dance class happening. So it's context. We need to alert ourselves to context. It's important. <laughs> this question is for Madam. Um, I'm not an artist, but I'm an aunt to an artist I accompanied her here. And so all of us are, all of you, the great artists, are enacting the stories from last centuries. But who is responsible for creating stories from this century? Poets are. We'll need poets. As often I have done a lot of work, a lot of you know, compositions where um, I have not found the text, and then there is a sense of you know, commissioning poets or scholars to write the kind of text we need. And if you're comfortable with that, and if there is metaphor and simile and you know, the poetic uh, ingredients that are necessary, then it is possible. 
So, I mean, that's how we have to, because there are some themes which you might not find earlier on, but as I said, I wanted to do something on trees and I didn't find it or I hadn't found it. Um, so I did have a, a very great scholar poet write it. So I think that's the way it evolves and it moves on. That is tradition. Thank you very much, Shanti. Um, I think that's a good point where we would like to close the uh, discussion session here in the auditorium, but we can definitely continue to you know, have discussions outside, um, keeping in mind that there is a concert to commence here at 12 o'clock. Before we conclude, we would like to request uh, Kumari Malavika Sarukai to felicitate all the four young speakers who have presented for us today. KP Rakesh. Vichna Vasudevan. Shweta Prachinde. We would like to express our sincere thanks and gratitude to Malvika Aunty and the four young speakers who have uh, shared their thoughts with us today. Give them a big hand.